Welcome back viewers. This is Russ Barkley with your weekly update on interesting research published during the past week. As always, you can find a lot more of the research in the thumbnail sketch that I do not review because, frankly, I don't find it all that interesting or that advances our understanding. But there were four articles this week that I thought we might want to pay some attention to, uh, so here they are. Uh, the first is an article that was published in the journal BMC Psychiatry, as you see here. Uh, it's a systematic review of the research available on suicidal spectrum behaviors in adults and adolescents with ADHD, looking at various risk factors that predict this spectrum of behaviors. Uh, and by the way, that spectrum includes such things as ideation, thinking about suicide, uh, second is planning about suicide, uh, third is attempts at suicide, uh, and fourth, unfortunately, are things like uh, accomplished suicide. So uh, let's have a look at what the findings were from this review. Uh, I can tell you that we studied this in my own Milwaukee longitudinal study. There are many other studies out there as well, uh, and we certainly found an increased risk, particularly during the high school years, to a lesser extent in young adulthood up to age 30, and then declining thereafter. But we did find an increased risk for both suicidal ideation and suicidal thinking, as have a number of studies. But uh, this is a review of all of it. And as you can see here, it was a review that looked at 40 studies that met their final selection criteria, and they analyzed the results of these studies and found that there was an increase in the likelihood of these various behaviors I've just mentioned called SSBs, and that ADHD symptom severity, ADHD persistence, female gender, family history of ADHD, childhood and parental influences, and the degree of social functioning impairment were all predictors of the outcome, that is, all predictors of likelihood of SSB, after adjusting for a variety of confounding factors, as well as psychiatric comorbidity, it was found that most studies show that adults and adolescents with ADHD did have an elevated risk for these various suicide spectrum behaviors. So, uh, not surprisingly, my own study found that by high school, the risk was at its peak, uh, it was predicted, that is, ideation, thinking about suicide, was predicted by comorbid depression. But the attempt at suicide and the severity of the suicide attempt was predicted by the symptom dimension of impulsivity in ADHD. And that has also been found in people who attempt suicide. When they look back at predictors of that, they find that impulsivity is the risk factor. Uh, and so it goes both ways. People with ADHD with high impulsivity, particularly if they have depression, are going to think about suicide. And if they're impulsive, they're going to probably attempt it. And then vice versa, those who have suicide spectrum behaviors are more likely to have ADHD. And those who attempt suicide, impulsivity is the predictor of the attempt. We also found, by the way, that ADHD teens and young adults had worse suicide attempts and were more likely to lead to hospitalization for the injuries from the attempts than were more typical individuals without ADHD. So a very good review. Have a look at it. I just thought you might want to pay attention to that. Uh, next up is a study that compared a community-delivered evidence-based practice called STAND. It's a family therapy program, a very behavioral family therapy program, somewhat similar to my family therapy program, Your Defiant Teens, but uh, actually focusing more on teen uh, autonomy uh, and teen functioning within the family. And then it was compared to a community-delivered treatment as usual, which typically includes medication, as well as maybe some family counseling uh, and other interventions. So uh, this is a very good study, in my opinion, uh, that did a randomized trial of treatments delivered in the community, not in a new university where things get done much better, uh, they're much more rigorous, they adhere much more to the treatment protocol. Uh, this is being delivered out there by routine community 
practitioners and what did they find? They found that results indicated that the treatment as usual, the UC here, that is usual care, was superior on parent ratings and on task measuring executive functioning relative to the family therapy program, the STAND program. They did find, however, that the STAND program was superior in its effects on adolescent motivation and in reducing uh, parental intrusiveness into adolescent behavior relative to the usual care, particularly when it was delivered by licensed therapists. So, you know, here is some evidence that, you know, family therapy only goes so far. It can be useful, but it needs to be combined with other interventions, such as those we usually do, such as medication, special educational services, uh, and other assistance in order to get the maximum benefit from these interventions. So I thought you might want to know about that as well. This is an article that appeared over in the journal Behavior Therapy just this past week. Next up is a uh, review. Uh, it's an actually, excuse me, it's not a review. It's actually a nationwide study over in Germany. Germany has national health records, just like Sweden and other Scandinavian countries do, and Germany does as well. And so here they went into this huge database that, as you can see here, involved almost 7,000 individuals aged 11 to 17. Uh, and they looked at, as the name of the article implies, uh, ADHD's link to inflammatory disease. This was published over in the journal Neuropsychiatry. Uh, and what did they find? They found that ADHD was associated significantly with an increase in lifetime inflammatory diseases, specifically atopic dermatitis, otitis media, and herpes simplex or infections, excuse me. Uh, and so with further analysis, adjusting for other relevant confounders, as they say here, the results remained. ADHD continued to be associated with elevated risk for these disorders. As you know from my lecture on this website on ADHD and health-related outcomes, ADHD is associated with increased risk for a variety of medical and health and well-being conditions. Uh, and that includes risk not only for accidental injury, we just talked about the risk for suicide, uh, the risk for car accidents and other things, risk for traumatic brain injuries, accidents of all types, but it also includes increased risk as we saw for obesity, for heart disease, for drug use, particularly for alcohol, marijuana, uh, and tobacco, and a variety of other health factors. So here we're seeing that uh, yet again, there are other risk factors linked to the severity of ADHD. So if you're interested, you might want to have a look at that article as well. Finally, we're going to wrap up this week's research review with a meta-analysis that was published in the journal PLUS ONE. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of the effects of physical activity on executive functioning in ADHD children and adolescents. Uh, as you know, I love meta-analyses because they combine uh, research, of uh, most of, if not all of the research that's been done, into a single type of analysis to give us a very robust reading on what is going on in that area of research, and specifically in this case, physical activity. What did they find? They found 24 studies that met their research criteria that included over 900 participants, and their meta-analysis showed that physical activity was associated with improvements in measures of inhibitory control, working memory, as well as cognitive flexibility. And that these effects were to some extent related to the type of motor skill that was being practiced, the intensity of, of the intervention, as you can imagine, the number of sessions of the physical activity as well, and the uh, weekly exercise on executive functioning specifically. So uh, a nice study, very nice meta-analysis, continues to show what we've seen in other research reviews, and that is that physical activity is beneficial 
to people with ADHD, and in this case, specifically to helping them with their executive functioning. So uh, I hope you found this research review this week useful. Please have a look at the thumbnail sketch for all the other research that was published this week. Uh, in addition, if you like what you're seeing and you find it informative, please recommend this channel to friends. And as always, I really appreciate it if you subscribe to this channel. So thank you all very much. Uh, be well and stay tuned for more research updates next week. Thanks so much.